right, that's enough of that. Gee, it's certainly good, uh, the way things are working out. I, uh, for a while there was touch and go. You know that feeling? It was just touch and go, nip and tuck. For every nip, there was a little tuck. And uh, it was touch and go there, but things are working out pretty good. Do you know that for this Christmas, for the first time, you can get yourself perfumed reindeer manure? Which uh, I think is kind of nice, and I think we better salute that, Don, would you please? And so we salute mankind in his constant, constant fight, which he never gives up, to make things better all the way along the line. Straighten things out. Get things, uh, you know, on the stick. <laughs> and uh, so tonight, before we do anything else, we'd like to salute you perfumed reindeer manure fans. Bring it up. It's available for the first time. Satisfaction guaranteed, says Sweetly scented. Get excited now. Just hey, hold it down, down, hold it. Boy, you get these engineers started. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. That's okay. That's enough. That's fine. That's just what we wanted. That's enough to send Staten Island and the screaming memes. And uh, we were just saluting all of you out there who perhaps might be waiting for things to start on. Uh, you know, you really can. It's a satisfaction guaranteed. Uh, it says, uh, enjoy the fragrance of... I don't know how reindeers are, although I've never been very close to a reindeer that close. Actually, I <laughs> it's kind of difficult. <laughs> it's beginning to uh, the nutty season is beginning to come up on us leaps and bounds. I I see uh, there was an ad here in, in the paper. It's uh, for little uh, religious uh, displays that you can put out in your front yard, and it said they come in plastic, weatherproof. And you can get several kinds. You can get one with a, with a shed and one without a shed. And, of course, the one without a shed is cheaper. And, and they advertise you can start with the three basic figures, the way they call them, three basic figures. And uh, it's, in a sense, it's kind of putting all of uh, Christian theology in one little lump sum. It's a satisfaction guaranteed, of course. And uh, I'm uh, fist fighting my way through uh, <laughs> Herald Square. That's Herald Square down there, isn't it, where Macy's is? Yeah, that's Herald Square. I'm fist fighting my way through Herald Square today, and I see they're putting up all the stuff. It's all getting ready now. Uh, they're, they're beginning to start the Christmas thing now, I noticed, long before Thanksgiving. And uh, I kind of like that. I The first Christmas display that I saw this year came three days after the 4th of July. And it said that for those of you who uh, are looking to do some shopping early, now is the time to do it. The guy was having a uh, a giant late spring clearance sale. And uh, he had all kinds of things. He had water wings and things like that uh, on sale. <laughs> oh, man, I'll tell you, it's getting to be. Uh, of course, the concept of time, the problem is time, naturally. What do you mean? There's nothing wrong with perfume reindeer manure. I kind of like that idea. You see, the, the, the thing is, we often penalize, as we so often do, you know, being rotten like we are. We often penalize the creative imagination. I think that's doggone creative. Now, I don't know. The only thing I doubt them, I don't know whether it's a legitimate reindeer, you know what. I, I'd hate to have second-rate stuff passed off on me. They don't guarantee that it is. They just simply say it's sweetly scented, and you're guaranteed to like the scent. Now, uh, you know, I'd hate to have counterfeit stuff around the house like that, you know. Everybody come over and cheering and everything, and the next thing you know, they've got old sheep. Uh, well, I don't know. You, know it's just, you can get pushed around just so much, you know, in this day and age. I, I don't like to get pushed around, do you? Let's salute all the people who push us around. Yeah, bring it up. There. Bring it up. There. Come on. Come on. We haven't saluted rotten people for a long time. You know, who, who are the, those people that shove you all the time on 6th Avenue when you walk along the street there and push you? Well, we're saluting them tonight. There must be an awful lot of them. You know, they, they all voted and stuff. The whole crowd there. And, I figure the whole country's going to hell because people keep shoving them back. So bring it up there. Let me try it. All right. You know, I'm really blown a very good bazoo these days. 
it's gotten better. Uh, it is. That's no question about it. No, uh, I'm, uh, I remember the first time that I gave up the Christmas card bit, uh, one Christmas. Oh yes, it was one of the terrible wrenches. <laughs> An awful, uh, well it was, a, it was really, I wrestled with my conscience. It was like wrestling with the devil. I, I wrestled with my conscience for weeks. And actually it wasn't that I gave up the Christmas card bit. It's, in a way, the Christmas card bit gave me up. I, I, uh, I got hung up, you know. You know how you do. You get hung up. And I'm running around, I'm pushing things and hollering and buying stuff and, you know, you know, fooling around. You know what I mean by living. You walk around tying your shoes and yelling and getting rained on and pushed and, you know, living. And all of a sudden it's four and a half days before Christmas and I have not mailed anything and I haven't bought anything. I have no cards. I got nothing. It was then that I became very moral. And I announced loudly to everybody, I am, I'm tired unto death of this ridiculous, cabalistic, commercial, idiotic business of Christmas cards. I don't like it. And everyone applauded. And I suddenly realized I was a crusader for good. Actually, I was just checking out on something I should have done, you know. <laughs> and so I didn't send any Christmas cards and I felt rotten for about three days. And then I realized nobody knew the difference anyway. Yeah, I'd meet guys on the street and said, thanks for the card, old man. I'd say, oh, it's all right, it's all right, it's okay. I'm glad you got it, fine. You got it in time? They'd say, oh, yeah, yeah, a couple of days. Marge had it up on the mantelpiece. Very nice. The one with the green leaves and all that, the little Santa Claus sticks his tongue out. Very clever. <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah. Speaking of uh, the Christmas card bit, uh, have you noticed more and more obscenity is creeping into the Christmas card world? Have you noticed that? You have. Very good. You're very observant. Uh, or do you have a sure ear for obscenity? A sure eye for pornography? What's well, beginning to creep into, into the Santa Claus world, and uh, of course we're not going to bring that out on this show. We're not going to talk anything about that, although we are going to sell genuine life-guaranteed Climbing rose book, tr uh, rose bush trellises. We have that. You want me to talk about the Christmas? Well, I think, uh, there's a lot of things to be said. Uh, you know, if we could say, if we, there weren't kids listening and children and all, about some of the stuff you can get. Do you know that you can get yourself a pair of, uh, Santa Claus, uh, uh what they call Santa Claus, uh, oh, how do they put it? Uh, Santa Claus, uh, rabbit fluff slippers with little bunny ears sticking out. And Santa Claus's face on the front. Well, yeah, yeah, I, I, you know that I wore a pair of those for 18 months or more when I first got in the army. I had a pair of bunny slippers with two eyes. I actually didn't have Santa Claus. It was two little bunnies. Had ears. One was blue and one was pink. Had ears like that. Well, my aunt Glenn gave them to me, and and uh, when I was going, she said, "Don't forget to take your slippers." And uh, it was the only pair of slippers I had, so I wore them. Crowder and a lot of other places for a while. I was. <laughs> Although, you know, that reminds me of a story since we're on the subject of the Army, which I did not intend to bring up here in connection with uh, that reindeer stuff. Because there's plenty of that stuff floating around the Army. It isn't necessarily reindeer stuff, although I've heard the expression. Uh, I have heard that expression. I'll never forget one day a guy came came into the barracks and purple with rage. He was just eyeballs were popping out. You know, he's yelling and screaming. And somebody hollered, says, uh, do you know what kind of, well... Uh, she would agree. I, I can't give you the expression. It had just busted me up, and it kept it kept the little unit that I was in going for at least a year, laughing every time we think we hear what this guy said. We laughed and hollered. Actually, the expression was an expression that you used the other night. No, you heard me use it, and you used it again. And he called he called the first sergeant. This he says, "Do you know what that little weaseling blankety blank said this time?" <laughs> And the whole crowd guys were knocking the butt cans over. And for those of you who are over 21 and you want to want to add a great new creative expression to your uh, collection of um, choice epithets of the riper kind, send your name and address to Let's Give It To Them This Time or uh, <laughs> or Whoopi in care of W.O.R. And uh, be sure to address it to John Gamblin and ask him what to call the first sergeant at Five o'clock in the morning when he said another one of those idiotic things. You know, uh, speaking of, uh, oh, did I? Uh, don't be so, don't be so uh, sharp on that. This is all King Hip here, friends. <laughs> you know, uh, funny though, uh, funny thing about the army and the bunny slippers. That reminds me of a story which I don't think I've ever told on the air, but, uh, it, it would make a great sequence in an army play or, an army movie, because it, it really actually happened. You know, most of these things that you see in the army movies and the army plays just never happen. 
Uh, I've watched endless uh, movies about the war and armies and one thing or another, and it's all it's all uh, Muslim, the yard wide mostly. Uh, you don't hear guys sitting around talking about chicks endlessly the way they do in the movies. They just don't do it. That's all. Uh, why? Well, a uh, lot of reasons why. Because there are other problems more pressing, perhaps at the time, usually in the army. And they just don't talk that way. And in general, I find, too, uh, looking back on it, that most of the guys in the Army, most of the guys around in a, in a group like that, are far more adult than they're painted by the movies. The movies, I always kind of paint them as a, as a combination Mickey Rooney, Skeezix with a little touch of Van Johnson, with maybe just a slight uh, a soup sound of Rock Hudson thrown in there. But they're not. You know, they're just a bunch of guys, and they're usually pretty pretty mature by this time. They've seen... Uh, a lot of stuff, and and one night, uh, you know, of course, uh, in the army, there's a constant shifting of personnel, which uh, adds to the life that you live and detracts from it too. It's a peculiar combination. It's like it's like if your friends were constantly disappearing, being replaced by new friends. Uh, but I mean, arbitrarily. Now, generally, when you split from somebody, you split because of mutual consent. Uh, you just finally say, well, look, I don't have anything in common with that klutz. Anymore, I, well, I, you know, either that or you just don't think about it. I mean, your 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 calls for lunch get fewer and fewer until one day you just don't see the guy for about two years, and then you finally do see him, and you don't have anything to say. And you say, "Well, we ought to have lunch, you know. We ought to. What's wow? Well, how come I never see you anymore, Charlie?" He says, "Gee, I don't know. I was thinking about you the other day. We ought, why don't you give me a call? Yeah, come on." And you know, it's that kind of voice where you both know you're not going to call. You just don't. You say, yeah, yeah, give me a call. Yeah, or oh, look, 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 why don't you give me a call? Give me a call. It's, it's easier for you to get over. You know, I've got, yeah, all right, I'll give And you, you both yell and holler, and you finally drift off down the street, and you get about a block away and say, oh, wow. Whew, Whew boy, it's good seeing old Charlie. Boy, am I glad I'm away from him. Uh, just that quick, you know. Well, in the Army, it doesn't happen that way. Usually, it's nipped off right in the, in the bud. You know, when you're, you just begin to enjoy talking to somebody, he shipped. Either that or some guy should have been shipped out of your life two and a half years before is still sitting around on the next bunk. And you can't shake him, you know. It's not like it is in the civilian life where you can just go to the accounting department, forget the sales department, and sit down there by the water cooler for a while. It doesn't work. Not a bit of it. And there's no such thing as privacy in the in you know Army life. You're All day long, you're on the rifle range with this lout, or you're in the back of a six-by-six six with this lout. And where are you at 10 o'clock at night sitting on your bunk? Who's sitting on the next bunk? That lout. And there you sit, you know, and you, you can't stand this guy. And it just begins to develop. It's like a giant boil, eventually, the, the barracks is. And, and sometimes, and then there's always about three guys in the barracks. They never show this in, in the army pictures. There's always about three sort of grayish men who are way older than all the rest of the guys, who have absolutely nothing in common with the rest of them, and seem to sleep all the time. Either they sleep all the time, or they're constantly uh, shining shoes or writing letters, or pressing shirts. Uh, there's those three older men. Now, they're not tragic older men like they usually have in the movie. Now, just three older guys. You don't know what there is. They're sort of grayish guys. Speaking of grayish older... This is WOR AM and FM New York. Do you have a little button that you want to hit there? Here it comes. Oh, uh -huh. Good oh. evening, monsieur. Who is the ale man? Right Your regular table is waiting. He <laughs> you Back by the kitchen man, again, huh? <laughs> May I take the lady's coat? You keep Bring your filthy hands off that chick. Every time. Over the usual, monsieur? Yeah, yeah. But this time, unusual. That's the taste of an ale man and a valentine ale. Older, keep more to the point. Next time you order up enjoyment, be a man about it. A Valentine Ale Man. You want to hear? You want to hear the tale of the, the tale of the poignant green pajamas. You want to hear that one? Or the night that trouble came to Company K. <laughs> you want to hear that? The trouble that night came to Company K in the guise of a pair of Ponji green pajamas. 
Did you ever hear, uh, is there such a cloth as named Ponji? Is there a Ponji? I've heard of it. Uh, it seems like way back in the ancient days. See, uh, let's, let's uh, get our other things done here. We have the Christmas fund. You know, you know that you've been around WOR, Don, for a long time. When it begins to seem to you that you're constantly reading Christmas fund spots, seems like it's always Christmas here at WOR, and we're banging the drums for the WOR's Christmas fund, children's Christmas fund. And if you'd like to send some DEAUX this year to the kiddies, and the WOR will distribute gifties to them. Got all kinds of little whoopee things we're going to give to them. Uh, oh, yes. Oh, yeah, very good ones. They really are, actually. Uh, there's some little tap dance sets and things. Uh, it's WOR's Children's Christmas Fun Box 710, Times Square Station, New York, 36, New York. Oh, uh, as long as we're uh, briefly uh, touching on Christmas gifts tonight, there was a great ad for a Christmas gift. It says it's suitable for Christmas gift giving. And it's a set that you can buy now to make wine in your own house. They used to call them stills. Uh, <laughs> they did. You can buy the whole thing. It's got little copper tubing and everything else. It says, have fun at home. Do it yourself. Of course, they don't say what happens when the, the feds bust in and <laughs> drag you out and start beating you around the head, you know. And the next thing you know, guys named uh, Creasy Thumb start calling up, wanting to know if you're muscling it on the west side. Uh, they don't say anything like that, but it's a terrific Christmas gift, I'll tell you, uh, especially for those friends and neighbors of yours who are away in institutions and uh, don't have uh, access to the neighborhood uh, whoopee store and uh, maybe would like to do a little fun stuff in their own cells there at night under the... Uh, the well, uh, <laughs> you know, speaking of that, I'll never forget the only time I ever saw one in, uh, in action. The, uh, the uh, mankind's desire to get bombed out of his skull, um, will, will absolutely not bow to any any problems. It will not bow to any kind of hazards or barricades that are set up to prevent it. You probably are aware of this. There must have been in the very earliest days, I'm sure, that the first time, the very first guy to discover that he could get bagged, uh, started a whole, started a whole slamo, which has not stopped yet. And, uh, must have been an apocalyptic moment there, if I can coin a, a bad phrase there. It must have been a moment of, of giant revelation. When Can you imagine them all scrunched around the cave there? Charlie and Og and Magoo and all the crowd there. They're all down in their haunches, and one of them gets up and goes around the back of the cave to pick a couple of blackberries. And, uh, you know, with a black, couple of, some of them, you know, the blackberries have fallen off and been laying there in a the puddle with the sun beating down on them. And he looks down there, it's kind of a greenish soup, you know, with the blackberries floating around, little bubbles on the top. And so without thinking, he figures, you know, you know, he's a pretty dumb guy in those days. He just reaches down, he says, oh, here's some blackberries, I almost have to pick them, you know. And he scoops a handful of blackberries and the blackberry juice and all of you. <laughs> he was the first guy to have his eyeballs water, you know, with the happy juice. <laughs> he scrunches down for a second. And the next thing you know, his gut is getting warm and his ears are starting to sing and smoke is coming out of his eye, you know. <laughs> we now pause briefly for 15 minutes while he's drinking the entire puddle. And uh, <laughs> he, 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 he straightens up, you know. He's been down on his haunches there. You know how this guy's... Spent a lot of time scrunched down in their haunches. They didn't walk up straight very much. He was the first guy to walk straight, as a matter of fact. The stuff got in him, you know, and the next thing you know, he's 18 feet tall. He wants to go back and fight the whole cave. <laughs> and uh, he's the skinniest one of the lot, you know. And so he gets up. And he looks up at the sun there, and he starts singing old, old fetish religious ballads. And he's bellowing, and he's way out of season, you know. The mistletoe season is gone. Uh, whatever it is that the, the, the druidic circle day has passed, and it's just an ordinary Tuesday, and he's baying at the moon, and you can hear the crowd in the in the cave. What's the matter with Magoo out there? What do I? And he comes reeling in, falls over, falls over a rock, hits his head on the woodwork, uh, gets up, and, right there, boy, in this damn cave. Well, he wants to take on the whole cave. And, uh, of course, the next thing you know, somebody wants to know what he's been doing out in back. What happened back there? Well, of course, we don't have to go any further. It led to the whole business. It led to Mel Allen. It led to, uh, just name it, you know? It led to, uh, 
the Schweppes man. It led to the WCTU. It led, <laughs> it led to, <laughs> it's a long thing. It's one of the great industries of the world was created. And there it is. And these, these things, <laughs> these things know no ending. And it must have been a, a, a moment when man first discovered one of the, one of his real basic weaknesses. He wants to get bombed. Uh, that is a basic weakness. Now, uh, a lot of guys now, I'm not, I'm not advocating this. I'm just merely saying that this is a fact. We all know it, don't we? I'm certainly not advocating it. I'm, I'm simply saying it's a fact. And, you know, that's, that's a funny thing about, about that, uh, that problem. A lot of people feel that the only time that a man can be uninhibited or really seem to dig or enjoy life is when he is under the influence of some kind of bombing agent. I have received dozens of letters over the years, uh, saying, that, oh boy, you must be certainly bombed out of your skull when you do your show. I mean, what is it? It's ridiculous. Isn't that true, Don? I don't know, know how that uh, comes about, but it certainly does, and I suppose it's a cop-out for those people who can't. Uh, some sort of a, some sort of a problem. But I will say this, though, that these, these moments, I have, a, I've often wondered about these moments when somebody discovered something nutty like that. And, uh, it went on. Because it wasn't a normal thing. Of course, that would be, in a way, a normal thing, I suppose, when the, when the grain uh, rests there in the in the old drainage ditches, and the next thing you know, somebody falls in. They push him in. You know they're having you know the how how old cavemen are yelling and hollering, having fun. Somebody gets pushed into the drainage ditch, and he comes out tight. You know, it comes out just stinko. And, uh, <laughs> and the next thing you know, they're all diving in the ditch there, and uh, it's terrible. Uh, but I I say though that there are other things that uh, let's take the the thing of clothing. Have you ever uh, looked at uh, at pictures of knights or something that uh, is way back, like a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago? A picture of uh, uh, even before that, let's say the Etruscans or something, and you see them wearing clothing, and you you can't quite imagine them making the stuff, you know, sitting down there weaving the cloth and all that stuff. Uh, you know, we've got factories now, <laughs> and we do all this stuff. But it, it just seems, uh, it always it always makes me wonder, when they started to do this, when they started, that must have been the moment that man stopped being an animal and became the lout that he is. Uh, that He started to make something like a little piece of stick or a little thing, and he's starting to straighten it out, and the next thing you know, he's got a yo-yo. And there he is. <laughs> he's ready to go. It's fun and games. Uh, oh, oh, you want to hear the story of the green pajamas? Oh, I was trying to get out of that. Now I'm getting all kinds of angry calls. Tell the story. Well, it uh, really was a, a complicated story and yet a subtle story. Uh, I'm in this company, and uh, old company K, and uh, company K, uh, like uh, like every company that uh, man has ever been part of, is both a uh, it's a place where you as an individual are in. And you're still an individual. And at the same time, it begins to have a sort of corporate image. It's funny. Uh, we're all of us here. We're at WOR, for example. We walk around and we're all individual men. We come from all parts of the country. And yet there's a peculiar sense of a corporate thing. We're all, WR, what is this thing? What is mankind? You know, you walk around. Do you feel like you're part of mankind? Uh, are you in the same class as, say, an Eskimo? Do you feel like you're part of uh, mankind just as much as, say, somebody in India or Tibet or someplace like that? Well, it's a very, diff very difficult question, and yet it's, uh, it's, it's there. Uh, it is a question, and, uh, and there is an answer, I suppose, but not quite an answer. And so when you're in something like Company K, a company, a group of men who are bound together by only one thing, each guy got a set of orders one day that said you're now assigned to Company K at the 803rd. And that's it. That's the only the only relationship you have. And so you all arrive at this place at different times. And then one day it suddenly is there, this company. There's 225 guys. And you've got a guy in charge of you. You've got a guy who works under him. And then you've got a couple of guys under, under him. And there you are, all this little group. It's a little ship now. Did you see Mr. Roberts? Mr. Roberts, the movie. I'll tell you this about Mr. Roberts as a movie, and just in passing, I saw it again the other night, that, that the meat of Mr. Roberts as a book was removed, and the more I see the picture, the more I realize that, that uh, the real meat of it was removed, the kind of a boredom, ennui, 
that the man who wrote, uh, Thomas Hagen, who wrote it, knew what he was talking about when he wrote the ship sailed from, from apathy to ennui and made an occasional side trip to monotony. Uh, this, this is a, this is really the warp and the woof and the thread and the texture and the taste and the whole business of a company. And so you begin to concentrate on little things. Little things. Uh, did you notice the peculiar morality of, uh, of this, uh, this, this, uh, picture and the book? The peculiar morality was somehow that the enemy was the captain, as though somehow it was his fault. They were all sailing on a rusty bucket from apathy to armway. Uh, it's a, a strange thing. You begin to feel that, oddly enough. Uh, this is a, this is the truth. That if if many people are working in a rotten company and all they're turning out is plastic widgets, which they hate, they begin to blame the boss for it. Somehow the boss becomes the symbol of all the stuff they hate, and uh, it be, and and then people begin to concentrate on little things. Somehow if we can get the boss, somehow if we could steal paper clips. I wonder how many people steal things in offices just to get back at the company. Now, they don't know it. They don't uh, you know, naturally, uh, objectively know that's why they're doing it, because they say to themselves, you know, maybe I, some, you know, I'll tell you, you never know when you might need a 14-foot paper cutter. You never know. And so here he's got it down on the base on a 14-foot paper cutter, which is only good for cutting one kind of paper, and that's the kind of paper the company uses. And so he's got back at him. <laughs> It's a suspicious thing. And so in, in Mr. Roberts, they were constantly throwing over the captain's palm tree. The captain's one little thing, and every time they threw the palm tree over, that was a big uh, striking out at the enemy. So this guy was the enemy. Incidentally, I had a feeling that, that uh, Jimmy Cagney did a terrible job in that movie. A very bad job. Uh, because he played a kind of a cutie pie tyrant. You couldn't really believe him that he was a tyrant. And uh, he was a cutie pie tyrant. He just was sort of funny. Mr. Roberts! You know, that kind of thing. He should have been really terrifying. Nobody could be terrified at this little guy, you know, the way he was playing it. He should have played it like he played one of his gangsters. You know, really sitting in there with a couple of chromium teeth. And when he pick up that microphone, Mr. Roberts! And everybody jumped and they come tearing up. Then they would have had the sense of helplessness that people get in a company. I remember one time being called down to the orderly room. If you want to hear that, that sense of helplessness, uh, I'm sitting around in the barracks and it's, it's like seven o'clock at night or something. And, uh, you, you hear the PA system all of a sudden in the barracks goes, Shepard, come to the orderly room right away. Whew. So <laughs> I get up and I trail out and I go down through the company street and I get, get into the orderly room and, and uh, there's the CQ sitting there, and he says, uh, "He says uh, Captain Cherry wants to see you." I said, "Captain, what? What do you mean? Wants to see me?" And uh, he, he's sitting at his desk, all dressed up in his uniform, and looking very official. And here I have been looking forward all day, you know, to this moment of hitting the sack. Boy, if there's anything you look forward to in the army, it's hitting the sack, you know. Boy, I was, here I was. I, I had my shoes, you know, my shoes are half off, and. My shirt is hanging and everything. I'm just about ready. My eyes are sort of half asleep. And he looks up at me. Cherry looks up at me. He says, Shepard? I say, yep. Yeah. Get in your class A's. My class A's? That means get dressed up, in case you don't know what that means. He says, yes, get in your class A's now. On the double. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Hop. Go. Let's go. Okay. So I turn and I run out. And I, I rush back to the barracks and I'm putting on my class A uniform, which is, uh, you know, the dress uniform, and I, I'm putting on my tie, and everything's, guys are saying, where, where are you going, Shepard, at this hour? I say, I don't know, the captain wants me to put on my class A's. And I come trotting back into the, into the orderly, orderly room there, and there's Captain Cherry sitting, all dressed up, by the way. He's just, he's, he's got his, you know, when a captain is dressed up, he's really dressed up. When a yard bird is dressed up, he's a yard bird. So, <laughs> I arrive, I arrive back there, an old yard bird Shepard in his class A's. He says, he says, go out, go out of the motor pool and get the Jeep. You're driving me tonight. I've got a date. Oh, jeez. I said, well, Captain Cherry, I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got KP tomorrow morning at four. He said, don't argue. Go out of the pool and get the Jeep. Oh, try. So, you know, I go out on the company street. Oh, jeez. And everybody else, why me? You know, of all the guys and, and everybody's walking around. And, and they're, they're going off to the, to the day room and I hear the pool balls clicking and I hear guys sleeping in the barracks and I'm dragging through the street. 
And I go down to the end of the street, and I turn right, and I go into the darkness, and there's the motor pool there, and I get in the Jeep. Our crummy Jeep had a K on the, on the, uh, on the, on the bumper there. I get the Jeep, and I can't find the key, and then I fool around, and the, the motor pool sergeant, where are you going? I said, I don't know, get off my back. He says, it got gas in it? He says, yeah, what do you think, stupid? This is the way life is in the army. What do you think, stupid? What do you think we do around here? <laughs> I said, well, get out of my way. And I go out and, well, and I go, well, I turn right and I arrive in front of this, the OD room there, in front of the orderly room. Well, and the dust flying. <laughs> and the captain comes out and he says, all right, stupid, put up the top. I can't take out a girl with the top down. So then I'm not putting the top up. <laughs> You don't want to hear the rest of this. This is a crummy, rotten, typical army story. And so ten minutes later, I am driving along the highway with the captain sitting next to me, and he's pulling on his gloves. You know, he's all dressed up, and he smells like shaving lotion and all that, you know. And I just smell like a GI who ain't had his shower yet, that's all. <laughs> and so we're going into town, and we arrive in front. He's telling me where to go, see, and I'm sitting there looking very official by now. And I'm, I'm being shepherd. Now, instead of shepherd the yard bird, I'm being shepherd the, the chauffeur. I'm sitting up straight, and we arrive in front of the chick's house. He says, wait here, shepherd. And he gets out, and I say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And up he goes between the hedges. And about two and a half hours later, I'm sitting there all this time. You know, MPs keep coming past. Who are you? You know, where, what are you from, Mac? Show me your pass. I go, oh, get out of here. The captain's in there. Show me the pass. One more yell out of you, and I'll go up and get him. And then they go on. Go, oh, that's the army. You want to hear the rest of the army? All right, smart guy. Don't get smart. Who do you think you are? I said, what do you mean, who do I think I am? I'm driving Captain Cherry of Company K to 803rd. One more yell out of you and he's coming down. All right. You're here another half hour. I'm going to be back. If you stole that Jeep, Mac, you're going to pay. And then they go. Stole a Jeep. Who wants a Jeep? So I'm sitting there for, for about two and a half hours, and, and see, you hear the, all the anchors coming out already, and I can see rest other GIs walking around with chicks and girls and all, and I should be back sleeping. I can think, oh boy, at four o'clock in the morning, I'm going to be on KP already. It's quarter to midnight, you know. I'm sitting there, and about, oh, about, about two and a half hours, he comes back out, and he's all dressed up, you know, still all dressed, and he's with a chick, and they, she's got this long white dress on. And she's got a, a gown, a whole bitch, you know. Oh, for crying out loud. It's like one of the movies. Oh, man, this is a chick with an evening gown, a whole bitch. And I sit up real straight, see. And, and, and I jump out. You know, you can't open the door in a Jeep. There ain't no door, you know. So I, I jump out. I sort of stand there. And I salute the captain. And I do the whole bitch, you know. And I bow. Because I know he wants this. He wants me to look like his lackey or something. So I bow from the waist. And, and the chick gets in, and I can hear a girdle popping. She's trying to step in the Jeep. And the two of them get, and they sit in the back seat. And I sit up there very straight, you know, and I've got my garrison cap on. And the captain says, he says, to the flaming Hawaiian pit, please, soldier. <laughs> Which uh, I've disguised it, the flaming Hawaiian pit. He says, to the flaming Hawaiian pit, soldier. Uh, yes, sir. And I'm going, you know, and I'm driving along, looking very official, sitting straight up. And then they start to neck in the back seat. That's great for the old yard birds morale. I can tell you this. I can see them in the mirror, you know. And it's really not good for your captain to be seen necking by the yard bird. And uh, so, you know, my old eyeballs are popping. I'm saying, come on, a boy, Sergeant. Let's go, boy. Arr, driving along. <laughs> and every time the captain realized that I'm looking at him in the mirror, he'd sort of sit up straight and straighten his tie. <clears throat> now, over there, uh, Amelia, over there, you see, is where we have our rifle range. Way over there on the other side. And we're driving. We finally arrive in front of the flaming Hawaiian pit. And uh, there's about 19 MPs because the place was always off limits uh, for yard birds. They, they didn't leave any. Uh, EM couldn't get in this place. And we, we, well, from the basic start, economically, we couldn't make it there. And so I arrive up in front of this place, you know, I stop and I jump out and I stand there saluting and everything in my class A's. And the captain gets out first, you know, it's very, it's discouraging, you know, to see a captain getting out backwards from a Jeep and trying to lead this chick out. She'd had a couple of drinks up in the apartment there and she's trying to step over the transmission and got her foot stuck there down there by the handbrake and the whole bit and her shoe came off. We finally got her out and, uh, oh, what a classy date. And they, they went into the Hawaiian flaming pit and all of a sudden it occurred to me, he's just about to go in. I say, oh, captain, he says, uh, yes, soldier. So what, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to wait, uh, sir, sir? And he just gave me this burning look. You move one inch, 
and it is the grease pit for you for the rest of your life, Mac. And he says, oh, uh, yes, and very pleasant. And he's trying to show this girl that he's loved by his men. He's Mr. Roberts, you know. <laughs> Let me tell you, any of you who, who have any doubts, there were doggone few Mr. Roberts in the, in the Army, just by the nature of the Army. And I suspect even in the Navy, that's the nature of fiction. I suspect that Hagen wrote himself up as Mr. Roberts, as his beloved officer. And so I said to him, oh, yes, sir. And I sat out in front of the flaming pit, Don, until about 3.30. Oh yeah, you got every about every five minutes the doors would burst open and six guys would fly out and you'd hear the bouncer, hey you stay out! Bloom bloom, they come rolling past, GIs bouncing up against the hubcaps on the Jeep, you know, getting up reeling and hollering. It was that kind of a place, you see? And once in a while you'd hear eighteen MP cars would come woo come up and they'd all go pouring in, guys with white helmets. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I know what I'm telling you all this about. So finally, at about 3.30, quarter to four, out comes the captain. And the captain comes out, and he's been drinking that rot gut they served in there, that, that watered, crummy rot gut, like about $4 a thimble full. But I'll tell you what it is. Whatever they made it out of it, it made your ears ring immediately. And he came out, and he's got his hat on sideways, you know, and his tie is pulled down. And the chick has lost both her shoes by now. You know, somebody zipped the side of her gold lame gown down and left it unzipped. And they come reeling in. The feathers are flying. <laughs> they sit in the back seat and we start back to her pad we turn around he says take us back to her house and I said okay and by this time he's not even saying soldier she's just hollering you know I, I, he thought I was a cab driver or something now you know he's an old New Yorker I got to turn around take her back there don't give me your lip so we turn back and we got about two thirds of the way back and the old jeep is rocking I don't know whether you've ever ridden in a jeep they got a short wheelbase and Jeeps rock like a rocking horse that's been out too long. You know, they just go up and down, up and down. It doesn't bother me. But after about ten minutes of this, both the chick and the captain get sicker than dogs. Well, the first thing I knew about it is the chick's got her head hanging out over the spare tires. <laughs> and the captain said, would you slow up? We're crying out loud. Slow up. And the chick goes, Wah! Well, I'm trying to get back because I know I got KP at 415. I got to get back. I got no time to make this scene. Well, we... we <laughs> We finally get the chick back, and I'll tell you, I just, I don't want to get indelicate here. But let me tell you, I got plenty of the backwash. It was disgusting. And and my Class A uniform, you know, the whole scene, I'll tell you, I smelled like I'd been rolling around in the gutter outside of the Hawaiian pit for weeks. And I and here I hadn't had, I hadn't even had so much as a Coke. And, and, and I'm tired, I'm bleary-eyed, I'm mad. And in silence, me and the captain start driving back to the camp. Well, he was silent because he was bagged. He didn't know what was going on. and He was sick and everything else. And so I drive him all the way back in through the door, in through the camp gates, back up through the darkness. We get back to Company K's, Company K's uh, area, as they call it in the Army, and pack past the motor pool. And he says, drop me off at the BLQ. I said, B-O-Q, B-O-Q, where's it? He says, B-O-Q, it's over in Area D, you stupid idiot. Is Area D, all right, all right. So I take the captain all the way over to Area D on the other side of the place there, about six miles away, and when I turn around, I come back to the darkness, and I arrive at the at the base motor pool. Now get this, the same sergeant is sitting there. And he's sitting on a paper box there, an old cardboard box, and he's just smoking his cigar, and he's he's drinking his black coffee. And I drive him with the Jeep, and the Jeep has left clean, spick, and span. The Jeep now arrives awash in old, used beer. Holy smokes, and you can smell it a block away. And this guy come, jumps up with fire in his eye. What are you doing, a Jeep, you nut? Look at that. All right, you got to clean it up. Huh? You don't think we're going to clean it up down here at the motor pool? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, you're going on report. You're going to clean it up. Well, so they run a bucket of soap and suds and hot water and a sponge. And so guess who is in his class A sponging down the Jeep at 4 o'clock in the morning? Guess who? Well, 10 minutes later, after the Jeep has been sponged down, I am back in the barracks in the dark, stumbling around, trying to put on my fatigues. I'm getting ready to go to KP, which opens in three and a half seconds. 4.15. Well, there I am, bleary eyed smelly, rotten. And I go, I said, I gotta take a shower. And I go down there, no hot water. The hot water's turned off. Oh boy, I'm not, I'm not about to take a cold shower the way I feel. Five minutes later, I am in the mess hall, smelling like an old brewery. 
smelling like the, like the entire Russian army has run over me in their stocking feet. Well, I'll tell you, I, I arrive in there, and the, the mess sergeant takes one look at me, and he says, yeah, Are you drunk? He's a weak kid, that drunken KPs. All right, get out. Go on. You smell rotten. What are you? You don't think the guys are going to come in? Five minutes later, I'm out in the grease pit all day long. I'm sleeping, unblinking, looking out into the cold light of dawn with the wind whistling through my ears. <laughs> and that night, after after KP is all over and everything is clean and ship shape, and I'm I'm tired, I have not slept for 24 long hours. I come walking back down the company street, smelling like the grease pit, smelling like the the royal flaming Hawaiian pit. And who do you think I meet there in front of the orderly room? Captain, guess who? Sharp, clean, looking great, his tie all tied, his Class A uniform on, and he's hurrying down the street, and at the end of the street is a jeep with another soldier sitting in there. <laughs> he doesn't even look at me. I just go right out past. He doesn't recognize me as his, compa his companion in crime of the night below. Do you, are you interested in stories like this, these terrible army stories? You want to hear all right, come on, come on. Let's just bring it up in there. It should be now time. There it goes. But I, I, uh, I can tell you hours and hours of real army life. Uh, do you want, oh, yeah, I ever did tell you the story of the green pajamas. Oh, I'm not going to tell you that story. That, uh, that, that was the, st the time the trouble came to Company K. And you see, this was Company K I'm talking about. Six straight weeks we had been eating salt pork. Six straight weeks we had been living on the worst food in the world. And we had received as a gift from the headquarters in the War Department the worst, most inept captain in the entire history of warfare. Also, he was an insane tyrant. And so Company K began to boil like, like a steaming, hissing pit of total anger until the night when the man in the green Ponji pajamas arrived. Do you want to hear the rest of that story? The time the captain suddenly became a hero. When Company K united in one small, tight band to ward off an obvious evil, the strange case of the green Ponji pajamas, and the war effort, and how Hitler was finally driven to his knees. 